This is an advanced tutorial on oral progesterone. We've had some kind of high-level questions on this topic and it gets quite complicated so we kind of want to go through that for those of you that have some questions on this in comparing different urine tests and different ways to collect as well as serum and saliva testing. Uh, so let's start with what happens to blood levels of progesterone when you take oral progesterone because this can actually be a much more complex topic than you would think. So you take oral progesterone, 100 milligrams, and in this study they peak at around one and a half. Now premenopausal levels are going to be up and over four. Just as a comparison, this is 100 milligrams oral. When you take an 11 milligram, which is sort of an odd dose, but 11 milligrams of progesterone as an intramuscular injection, you get peak levels of around four. So 10 times less progesterone yet the dose or the serum levels are much higher. So when you give a bigger injection, here's a 50 milligram injection, they're peaking at 14.3. So now you're well up into the premenopausal range with less progesterone than we took orally to get up only to about one to two nanograms per milliliter. You can also get more progesterone in your serum by using vaginal administration. They didn't collect the points here in the middle, but you can see that you're well up and over kind of the bottom end of that premenopausal range with the same dose taken vaginally. So again, there's not much progesterone when you take it orally. Now some of you will say, wait a minute, I've given 100 milligrams of progesterone, I've measured serum, the levels go up far more than you're implying, and in fact, you can find many studies that will agree with you. Here's one where plasma concentrations are within the luteal phase range, so that's going to be higher than four or five, for up to seven hours. The problem with that is those values are not accurate. So if you give oral progesterone, here goes the serum value up, and again, here's kind of the edge of the premenopausal range. So in this case, it stayed higher than that for about four hours, but still elevated for six or eight hours. The problem is when you use a more accurate assay, a mass spec assay, you can see that the values only get marginally elevated and they're back down within two hours. So these are the same samples being measured here. So the difference between these two measurements is all cross-reactivity because these are amino assays. They measure things that look like progesterone. So when they see progesterone, the values go up. When they see something that looks a lot like progesterone, but they go up a little. In this case, you're giving 100 milligrams of progesterone orally, so there's this extensive metabolism in your gut, and your blood, as well as this test, is flooded with compounds that look an awful lot like progesterone, and this is the effect. You get this false positive. So with oral progesterone, you, you get increases in serum that are only s slight, and much less so than with an injection, with sublingual, or with vaginals. But, to confuse that, as we said, serum values can be falsely elevated due to inaccurate methods. So you can see some of the progesterone metabolites here. So progesterone's in the middle, and it gets metabolized by a couple pathways, the 5-alpha pathway, and then it goes in this direction down the pregnine pathway, and it also goes, a lot of progesterone goes down the 5-beta metabolism pathway. And what, what you measure in urine is this metabolite right here called pregnane diol. And when you measure compounds in urine, what you're really looking at is that compound with a sugar molecule on it, essentially a glucuronide. So the body has to make them water soluble before you'll see them in urine. And that happens on a hydroxy group like this one here. And if you'll see, progesterone has no hydroxy group. So you don't really see it much in urine at all. So you always are measuring metabolites and not progesterone itself. So when you take oral progesterone, the progesterone gets metabolized extensively. And so those values no longer correlate with progesterone values in serum. So let me show you this one more way. Here's a 100 milligram injection of progesterone. Remember, we said that a 50 milligram injection will get you up into the upper part of the premenopausal range. So in terms of serum values, these are going to be very high. And we said with oral progesterone, uh, the, the serum values are actually going to be 
very low, yet look at the urine values, they're about the same in these two cases. So in terms of the actual progesterone values, the urine values probably reflect what's going on very well in an intramuscular injection situation that probably correlate with serum progesterone very well. With oral progesterone measuring in urine, again, the serum values are going to be low, but the urine values are going to be high for the same reason, because it's extensively metabolized. Lots of metabolites, not very much native progesterone. So you say, well, if I'm not getting very much progesterone, does it even work? Yes, it does. So here's a study where they gave women estrogen and, ca and thereby causing proliferation. And when you give 100 milligrams of progesterone orally, you get reduced proliferation. You give more progesterone, you get even greater reduction of proliferation. Now, those serum levels are not enough to cause that reduction in proliferation. So what is actually causing the progesterone-like effect? Some of it's probably coming from progesterone because you do make some, but a lot of it's probably coming from progesterone metabolites. Take allopregnanolone. This is the metabolite that will help you sleep. If you take progesterone at night, look what happens. If you take it orally, you get gobs of this stuff and it helps you to sleep. If you take that dose and you transfer it to a vaginal dose, you don't get allopregnanolone. Yes, you get lots of progesterone, so it's good for that. But if you want help sleeping, then you can strategically take it orally because we know we get lots of metabolites. And again, these metabolites are responsible for some of progesterone's effect. So what we have, we have three primary pathways that it goes down. What happens is the progesterone hits your gut and the gut bacteria send it down the beta pathway. And then the intestinal wall sends it down the alpha pathway. And then if it hits, and that's where you're going to get allopregnanolone, uh, which will help with the sleep. And then if, you, if it reaches the liver, then you can actually make these pregnenediol metabolites. So we measure all three major pathways, and then we plot the two the two primary pathways, more than 75% of your progesterone is heading down these two pathways, and with oral progesterone, it's probably even more. And so we want to measure both of these, but we're not plotting these in this case against a premenopausal range. The premenopausal range is something like 250 to maybe 1600, I think it is. And so a premenopausal woman is going to find themselves in this range right here, and when you give it orally, again, what do we say? We're getting lots of metabolites. So for this particular situation, we're giving a reference range of 2621 for the beta to 6826. And you can see for this particular person, they're kind of right in the middle of the reference range. So they have an expected level of the beta metabolite. However, this particular push person is not pushing a lot of the progesterone down the alpha pathway, so they're actually lower than most people usually are when they take oral progesterone. So this person may not get a lot of the sleep benefits from progesterone if they're not making as much of the allopregnanolone. Uh, and then the progesterone value that we measure here is simply a weighted average, so it's essentially right in between those two. So this is what we do. All three pathways, we want to see what's going on with all three pathways because I think that gives you a better idea of you know, just what's going on. So if we want to compare two people, this is a good contrast. So here's the person we just looked at. right? Average levels of beta, low levels of alpha, so pretty average levels um, when you're looking at both metabolites. And then you can also see for this person the pregnine diol is in the upper part of the range, but it's pretty normal. So look at this other person. It's a pretty different look. So the beta pregnant diol is actually not that different than person number one. So if you were doing a normal urine test, that's all they measure. And so you would say, nah, these people are about the same. When in fact, there's about a six-fold difference in terms of the alpha metabolite. So this person's got huge levels of alpha metabolites, which is going to give you a pretty strong clinical effect. So I think there's a lot of value in measuring both of these pathways because a lot of times people like this will be able to scale back a little bit on the dose and still get that help with the sleep because they know they're making a lot of the alpha metabolites. Now I think it's actually pretty interesting to note 
that the beta metabolites are higher and the alpha metabolites are much higher, which means the metabolism happened in the gut pretty extensively. What does that mean? It means not very much got to the liver. Well, look at the metabolite that happens in the liver, and it is the only one that's substantially lower than the other patient, and so that is... Uh, noteworthy. Why is that noteworthy? Then this is all in preliminary stages, but I think this is really interesting and worth uh, us collectively to start considering is pregnendiol. That is this pathway here, and this is the alpha pathway. And what are we looking at here? We're looking at the proliferation of breast cancer cells in vitro. You take breast cancer cells, you add those pregnin metabolites, the proliferation goes down. If you add the alpha metabolites, you get excessive proliferation. So in terms of our risk profiles, we probably want to see people making, if you look at this third person down here, they're outside the range high, the supplementation range for the pregnine dial. So they really are pushing progesterone down this protective pathway, whereas the person we just reviewed with the very high alpha, they're making a lot of these metabolites. Now, we don't yet know exactly how significant this is because this has only been looked at in vitro, but I think it's worth, and we want to get out ahead of this, starting to look at different metabolites. Again, I think the, the problem is pretty much every lab out there is measuring just the beta metabolite. Now, yeah, it's an abundant one, but it's down in more inert pathway, and you're not really seeing what's going on with some of these metabolites, and I think that's going to be important as time goes on. So with oral progesterone, we can look at those metabolites, and we can deduce some interesting things. It's still not a situation where you've got a one-for-one -one relationship where you can look at a value and just say, okay, the value's low, so increase the dose, or the value's high, so decrease the dose. You've got to work at it a little bit more, but I do think you want to stay away from serum and saliva testing for this particular situation because, one, the return to baseline is too fast, and two, when you do see an increase, it's not accurate unless unless you're using a mass spec measurement anyway. So that really is of limited value. So serum values don't increase much. Metabolites are responsible for a lot of the clinical effect. And testing can be of limited value. And we're really trying to restore some of the value to testing following oral progesterone by looking at all of these different metabolites, looking at them relative to a range for oral progesterone supplementers and then trying to deduce what makes sense. For some patients you might want to scale back the dose. For some patients you might want to increase the dose and for some patients you might look at that picture and also look at the patient and maybe they're one for example that pushes it down a pathway that doesn't seem to be favorable and maybe they're not struggling with the sleep issues. Maybe you want to move them to a different route of administration but I think you can make some better informed decisions with this test relative to what's typically available for this situation. If you've got comments, questions, you'd like to contribute to this conversation, we certainly would welcome that. Uh, and you can email us at info at precisionhormones.com.